The Party Grows, Eldridge Joins, The Paper Panthers. In San Francisco, there was a group of cultural nationalists who named themselves the Black Panther Party of Northern California. We call them the Paper Panthers. David Hilliard first called them that. Their name, the Paper Panthers, is directly related to Mal calling the coward and running dogs of the imperialistic power structure of the West Paper Tigers. But there is also a more direct reason. We were called the Black Panther Party for self-defense, and they, the cultural nationalists, called themselves the Black Panther Party of Northern California. We don't know who had the name first, because around October 1966, around the time we had printed up our 10-point platform and program, they went and printed up something, maybe a periodical. We went to them and said, What are you doing for the community in regard to the revolutionary struggle? If you're doing something for the community in the revolutionary struggle, Huey told them, We'll join your set. But we don't see you doing it, so let us alone. They had printed something that was an attempt to cut us up intellectually. Roy Ballard came over to our office and gave us a long line that the Northern California branch of the Black Panther Party, these cultural nationalists, were having a conference in Hunter's Point, the large black ghetto over in San Francisco, a Malcolm X Memorial Day conference. This was held on the date Malcolm was assassinated. He asked if we would come over and provide security for Betty Shabazz. He stood there and bragged about the fact that the Black Panther Party of Northern California had all kinds of brothers over in San Francisco with guns. In fact, he had 20 dudes with guns. In that very first conversation, he mentioned 20 dudes. Then he mentioned 16 dudes for sure and said they were all ready and he wanted to know if we would bring 30 or 40 of our Panthers over. After we had talked about the fact that Betty Shabazz was coming into town and we wanted to have security for the sister and escort her around town, Huey said that a small group of dudes was best, that we just bring over eight brothers at the most, and the most he should have is another eight cats. But Ballard was running around talking to us like, Man, we got more guns than that. We can bring all of them. He was trying to brag about numbers, but you could see through it. We said to ourselves that since these cats had decided to pick up guns, we could go forth to try and work with them. Here we always said we're ready to unite and work with any brothers anywhere because the name of an organization doesn't mean anything. It's what an organization is that's important. And if these guys finally had realized that we'd been on the street patrolling the cops already and had been trying to implement a program to educate black brothers, if these guys were ready to pick up the gun, if they were making an effort to do so, then we should work with them for the sake of unity in our black community. Roy Ballard went on and went off at the mouth and asked us to come to one of their meetings over in San Francisco. So we decided to get up and go on over to the meeting about three or four days later at the Northern California branch of the Black Panther Party's office, the Paper Panther's office. We got over there and there was nobody in the office. We drove around until somebody found out where Roy Ballard lived. We went to his house and waited out front. He drove up and we went upstairs. He was talking to us and he was explaining about how he had eight men. We said, I thought you had 16, although we don't need but eight. Oh, well, he says, it really ain't but eight cats. He was explaining some more details about this conference. He was really trying to manipulate. But we were concerned about the changes in the amount of men he had, the brothers he had with guns. Well, the brother didn't have much to say that evening, no more than that we're going to have to get together and have the gun laws checked out thoroughly. Huey P. Newton, of course, had checked out the gun laws very thoroughly because we read those books, law books in the penal code, in the law section of the legal aid service of the poverty center where we worked, and Huey was going to law school at night. But Roy Ballard made a big play about how he was doing all this work in the black community 
for black people. And I suppose they did have some statistics down and that kind of stuff. Another meeting was set for a few days later. And this time, we all went in our uniforms. Me, Huey, Bobby, Reginald Forte, Sherman Forte, and Orlando Harrison. We all got down our uniforms. The blue shirt with black leather jacket, black pants, and black beret. We loaded up and got our guns and things and went over to their office that evening about 7.30. We walked into the office and there was a bunch of what I've always known to be jive-assed intellectuals sitting around. I run with some of them, Douglas Allen, Kenneth Freeman, and West Coast Underground R.A.M., and some other dudes there were just shits. The dudes whose doors I've told about breaking in were just jives, like the cats that ran with Kenny Freeman. I didn't know it till later, but Eldridge was sitting in there too. I didn't know Eldridge then. Roy Ballard and Kenny Freeman and the others were all sitting in a circle. And they seemed to be going through their everyday business. I remember Kenny Freeman saying some simple shit like, If black people don't get together, we're just going to have to get uptight on them and make them get together. And I said to myself, Now who in the hell does he think he can make get together? So me and Huey and Bobby and Reggie and Sherman and Orlando, and I think there was another brother with us, all sat down and listened. And after we had been there for about 25 or 30 minutes, listening to them go through their little intellectual changes, feeding off of their ability to articulate, and as they put it, run it down to each other, looking at them acting like a bunch of armchair revolutionaries, I made a gesture to Roy Ballard and asked him when we were going to settle this thing about how we were going to handle the escorting of Sister Betty Shabazz. He said, In a minute, brother. In a minute, we're going to take care of that. As an intellectual always does to a field nigger. Roy Ballard did come around to it in the context of his conversation with Kenny Freeman and the rest of the intellectuals in there. The point was that the conference was coming down and Betty Shabazz needed to be escorted here. And the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense would handle the self-defense aspect of the operation. He asked us if we wanted to speak at the conference. And Huey said, yes, we'll speak. Vince Lynch said, that's good because you can go into the history of self-defense. Huey said, I'll be talking about politics. Kenny Freeman popped up and said, do you want to speak on self-defense or politics? Huey said, it doesn't make any difference. They're both one and the same. They went through some intellectual changes with a few statements here and there. Roy Ballard, Kenny Freeman, and a couple of other people and came back to the same question that they had asked Huey about a minute before. Do you want to speak on self-defense or politics? Huey said that they're both the same thing. If I'm talking about self-defense, I'm talking about politics. If I'm talking about politics, I'm talking about self-defense. You can't separate them. They didn't understand Huey when he said politics is war without bloodshed and war is politics with bloodshed, a continuation of politics with bloodshed. They didn't understand antagonistic contradictions and non-antagonistic contradictions both being lodged in the arena of politics. They didn't understand that the plight of the black people's struggle here in the confines of decadent America is a political military whole unified within itself. Then Vincent Lynch said, You could talk about Nat Turner, then you could bring it up to date. You could talk about Brother Robert Williams, then you could talk about the deacons for defense in Bogalusa, Louisiana, and you have that whole historical thing put together. Then we can speak about the politics. Huey said, very firmly to all of them that we would speak and we would speak it won't make any difference if we're talking about self-defense or if we're talking about politics if we're talking about politics and the survival of black people it's the same thing they finally decided to shut up they didn't want to mess with huey because huey was sitting there with the big 12 gauge shotgun and he had his men all around him decked down sharper than a motherfucker sharper than two tacks 
And Huey wasn't about to sit there and lollygag with these jive dudes who called themselves revolutionaries who didn't even have the understanding of integrating the gun for self-defense with politics. I'm pretty sure this is what frustrated Brother Huey and made him not want to deal with those cats, but we tried anyway. I made a gesture to Roy Ballard to get on with the thing because we had come over to lay down some plans about operations for security for Betty Shabazz and we wanted to know how many men they were going to provide for the operation. We got up and went outside and they got to talking about they had five men with pieces and guns and they'd be loaded down ready to go and that they would let us know when Sister Betty Shabazz was coming in. They talked to me and Huey alone. They told us that she would be coming in on a Monday, so we split. Then we got a phone call from them Monday saying we would have to come over there. So we rushed over and they told us she'd be there that Thursday. When we got over there on Thursday to the Northern California branch of the Black Panther Party, Roy Ballard, Kenny Freeman, Isaac Moore, and Douglas Allen were there, along with some other cats. We come to find out one of them was a special nigger pig. Huey says, Look, we are not going to go and give any security to Betty Shabazz with pigs around, with nigger cops around. I don't give a damn if they're black or white. They're cops for the system. One of those guys said, Yes, but he's blacker than you. He's blacker than you. He was referring to the cop's skin color. I said, it doesn't make any difference. We aren't going with any pigs, and that's all there is to it. Huey P. Newton said, We aren't going with any of them. It's not possible. We can't function with cops in any way. Kenny Freeman called Huey to the side and told him that he didn't know Roy Ballard had set this up. So I said, How many guns do you have? They said, Five. I said, when Roy Ballard first came over, he come talking about 20 men with guns. And the next statement he made before he left that first time was 16 with guns. And after that, he says he has 8 with guns. And after that, he says he has 5 with guns. Now I wonder if you guys got any guns at all, or anybody with guns. You been talking this shit. So have you got anybody at all with guns or not? He would say, right on. You be here and have some guns with you tomorrow or what you guys think you're handling in terms of security. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense will take over and we'll handle the whole damn thing if you aren't here with guns. You better be here with loaded guns right down to the gills. Kenny Freeman got up tight. Okay, yeah, man, yeah, man. We'll be here tomorrow, man. We got five cats with guns, man, to go along with this operation. So we all got together. We got eight brothers together and came over on Thursday. Just before we left, they said Sister Betty was arriving at San Francisco Airport somewhere around 1.30 or 2 o'clock p.m. We got over there around noon. Douglas Allen, a cat named Leo, who had an M1, and Isaac Moore with an M1 were there. Kenny Freeman says, Hey, man, you know these brothers here, man? They got their stuff with them, man, and they're ready. Everything is cool. And I think Roy Ballard's got a piece with him. I said, I thought you cats were going to have five cats, man. Well, man, we got these cats here right offhand. And I myself, I'm going to be there, you know. And Douglas Allen, you know, he's going to be there. So everything is cool. Everything's all right. I said, yeah, man, okay. I didn't want to talk to him anymore because I just didn't dig the dudes. They were intellectual jivers. Intellectual, cultural nationalists. Punk motherfuckers who sit in a fucking armchair and try to articulate the revolution while black people are dying in the streets. Huey defined him very well. Huey said, I see Kenny Freeman is a dude who wants to compete with everything that's going on. That's the only thing that satisfies his little chicken shit ego is to sit and compete. We all loaded down in cars, caravan fashion. We had our guns. Kenny Freeman. Leo, Isaac Moore, and Douglas Allen were in another car, and Roy Ballard was in a third car, five of them. We told them to have five guns with them, but they wound up, from what I saw, only having three guns. Roy Ballard flashed his little 25 pistol sitting in his belt. 
Huey and I didn't have any faith in 25 pistols because they could get you killed. Anyway, our eight dudes and their five dudes loaded up in the cars and drove to the San Francisco airport. And I noticed one thing as we got in front of the terminal. Kenny Freeman was in a car behind us, a white station wagon. He got out of the car. It was three or four blocks down from the terminal drive, but I could see him stopping the car and getting out of it. He got out of the car. Then all of the brothers piled out with their guns because we drove up there. Guns showing and everything. I noticed that Leo and Isaac Moore, Kenny Freeman's boys, were about 30 feet away from us with their two M1s. Just then, a pig came out. A head, plain clothes pig. Huey saw him and some other pigs coming. So Huey told everybody, like he always tells the brothers, Don't nobody say nothing. I'll do the talking because we don't want too many people trying to say something at one time. The pig came and asked, What are you doing with these guns? And Huey said, Well, you're a cop. What are you doing with your gun? Then a uniformed black pig walked out and said, What's he doing with this gun? Is that gun loaded? And Huey said, If I know it's loaded, that's good enough. Well, what are you doing? The plainclothes pig asked. Huey said, We're going to the airport to get our sister, Betty Shabazz. Why? If you understand Huey, you know Huey wasn't answering his questions as if he had to answer him. Huey was giving orders to me to get the brothers and sisters together because he knew what he was going to do. He knew what the party was there for. He knew what the delegation was there for, and that's all there was to it. Then stupid Roy Ballard walked up and said humbly and meekly, Why should we have all this argument? Sir, you should read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and you can understand why we are here with these guns. Huey said, Oh man, I do the talking. You go on back. Wait a minute, Huey. Wait a minute. Let me explain it to him. Huey said, This is absurd. How do you explain to a racist, ignorant, bastard cop, cops of the power structure who are behind the killing of Malcolm, who kill black people, and who are here to try to tell you you can't go anywhere? This is no time to stop and read the autobiography. And Roy Ballard was still in a humble and meek manner, trying to explain to the cop that he would understand us if he would read our brother's book when the pigs in America were glad Malcolm was dead. The man said, Well, you can't go into the airport. What do you mean we can't go into the airport? We have to be able to go in and meet our sister there, Betty Shabazz, the brother said. Huey said, be quiet. We're going in the airport. This is public property and you can't deny us our constitutional rights just because we've got guns. We're going in whether you like it or not. I'm going to exercise my constitutional rights and the Panthers here are going to exercise their constitutional rights and that's all there is to it. The pig said, But, Huey interrupted him in a firm and clear manner, This is public property. The pig said, it's private property and you're not. Even if it is private property, Huey said, if it accommodates more than 200 people at a time, then any citizen has a right to exercise his rights on it. So get out of our way. We're going inside whether you like it or not. Swine! Meanwhile, Isaac Moore and Leo were standing 30 feet or more away from us with two M1s in their hands. Ballard was running around flapping at the jibs. He didn't know what he was doing. Huey said, all right, brothers, in a column of tools, get together. Bobby, put them in a column of tools. So I put everybody in a column of tools. To Leo and Isaac Moore, I said, come on, you dudes. Come on up here and get in the column of tools. They hesitated. Meanwhile, Huey was still checking this pig when all of a sudden about 20 pigs spread out around us in the streets out there. But Huey P. Newton wouldn't let that phase him at all because he knew he had a shotgun and he knew he had some brothers with him. He knew his constitutional rights and he was going to make sure that people got down to the nitty gritty of things. So Huey is talking with the pig telling him we're going inside anyway and also trying to make Roy Ballard be quiet 
and shut up because Roy didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know how to handle the racist, and Huey did. We got in a column of tools, and Huey said, let's go. We started moving, and I finally got Leo and Isaac Moore to fall in, in the rear with me. Huey was in front. The first thing Leo and Isaac started complaining about was, man, get the sisters out of here, get the sisters out of here. I say, why? We got guns, we can defend ourselves. Man, if they start shooting, man, Leo was saying, it's bad enough having to protect ourselves, let alone having to protect them too. I said, I heard that one of the sisters has a pistol in her purse and she isn't worried. Don't worry about it. Leo was overly concerned about the sisters being in the column of twos. Leo and Isaac were holding the M1s. And at the time, I didn't know that these M1s were not loaded. Later on, I could see how his over-concern about the sisters being there and standing 30 feet away related directly to the fact that they did not have loaded weapons. We all went up into the terminal and some of the pigs were walking around us. They were following us. And they were also walking in front of us. But we just barged our way in over this so-called head cop or sheriff. They have these little security type sheriff guys out there at San Francisco airport. We went inside and upstairs. And from there we went all the way down to the particular gate we were supposed to be at. Brother Hakeem Jamal, Malcolm's cousin by marriage, had gone to check out the exact time Sister Betty was going to arrive. Jamal came back, and by that time, we were in the lobby section. It's like a hallway, about 20 feet wide, and that's where the gate area is. We walked around, we walked inside the gate area, and all the brothers sat down. Little Joe, Orlando Harrison, Bobby Hutton, and me and Huey, three or four other brothers, along with the punks, intellectual jive, motherfucking cultural nationalists, Isaac Moore, Leo, and Roy Ballard. Kenny Freeman had gotten out of his car and was way, way down the street, three blocks away. he gotten out just before the confrontation had started. I don't know who he thought he was fooling because I heard later on that he said he was planning strategic security. That nigga was just scared. That nigga wasn't coming up there at all. That's why he had those dudes running around there carrying unloaded guns. John George, a lawyer they knew, had suggested that they carry unloaded guns, and they went and did it, but they didn't tell us that. Huey doesn't believe in anybody carrying unloaded guns. We were waiting for the plane to come to the gate area. While we waited, something happened. Those pigs were all outside in this 20-foot aisle to the gate section, and some old pig came over and acted like he was going to take a picture of us. Huey walked up to him and said, don't take any pictures. People began to look, so Huey said, We're not going to let them take any pictures. I walked over and stood in front of the pig with the camera, more or less to block him, to keep him from being able to take pictures. Then Huey said, If you take any pictures, we're going to take your camera away from you, and we're going to smash it. The pig acted as if he still wanted to take pictures. So Huey said, All right, people. You see this jive racist cop here? He's trying to provoke something. We told him not to take any pictures, and if he takes any pictures, he's going to provoke something. That's where it's going to start at, right now. The other pigs got to looking and said, Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. Beckoning for this pig with the camera to come on out to the far end of the lobby section. They decided they didn't want to take any pictures because Huey P. Newton wasn't driving around. He had that shotgun in his hand, and he was letting people know where it's at. I noticed Isaac Moore and Leo standing over away from us. They were standing next to the wall together. We were kind of spread out, but they got away from us. We waited for Sister Betty Shabazz. The plane came up to the gate and let the people off. As soon as she came out, we surrounded her. Brother Hakeem Jamal was there, and we surrounded the sister and began to walk out. The pigs... I don't know what the hell they thought they were doing, were walking around us, acting as though they were security. But we had as many guns as they had. We came outside and Sister Betty said, Who are these fellows here? Jamal answered her, These are some brothers from the Black Panther Party for self-defense. 
I noticed that Leo and those cats were nil on gun laws and the way the party was functioning. One time Isaac Moore had his gun level and people were walking by in front of his gun. At the time I was still thinking that the guns were loaded but he had it level then he kind of dropped it very relaxed. When he was pointing the gun at people he wasn't paying any attention to it. So I said to him man don't you point no gun at nobody like that a loaded weapon. I said that's assault with a deadly weapon whether you're doing it maliciously or not. You get charged on a bullshit ticket if the cops out here knew the law. They just don't know the law. Hold that gun up. Then he was getting Betty Shabazz into the car. I saw Isaac Moore when he put his gun in the car. He put his gun in and slid it under the seat. We didn't carry guns like that. Sliding them under the seat. It was very necessary at that time to carry our guns in the open. Because it was exhausting a means of being able to carry guns that way. And at the same time, educating the masses of black people about the necessity for guns and how self-defense was politically related to their survival and their liberation. Confrontation at Ramparts We got in the cars and we drove back to the Ramparts office on Broadway in the middle of downtown San Francisco. We got to Ramparts and went inside. Douglas Allen was sitting there looking like he was sick and scared and didn't know where the fuck to go. I can't blame him for being scared. There were just too many damn people with guns there and I don't know where Kenny Freeman had disappeared to and Isaac Moore was hanging around somewhere. I stationed two brothers outside. Little Joe outside on the right of the steps and this older brother on the left of the steps. He had a forty five, and Little Joe had an M1. We then went inside. There were some interviews scheduled so Huey was with Sister Betty all the way inside the Ramparts office down the hall where she was talking to Eldridge Cleaver whose writings on Malcolm X she had admired. I made periodical runs between Huey where he was with Sister Betty and Eldridge Cleaver all the way back to the front door. I came to the front door one time and a couple of pigs had driven up. I stood right on the top landing of the front steps and a pig walked up to Little Joe and said, Who are you? Little Joe said, I got nothing to say to you. And if you have anything to ask me, I'm taking the Fifth Amendment. Just like that. The pig said, Well, all right. And when he got up beside me, I was looking dead at him. Looking firm right in his eyes. He kind of took a couple of steps up from the bottom steps. And he said, Who's the leader? I said, I'm one of them. Why? Well, I'd like to talk to you. I said, God damn it. I don't want to talk to you. So you can go on away from here. And he said, oh, turned around and walked away. Then more pigs drove up. They were plain clothesmen. They looked at little Joe. He looked like he was too young to be carrying a weapon, but they didn't say anything else to him. Three or four more pigs drove up, so I called for a couple of more brothers to come outside and then walked halfway down the hall. Betty Shabazz was about to come out. I walked all the way to the front and there were four or five pigs outside. A few minutes earlier, a lieutenant pig had asked Warren Hinkle, the editor of Ramparts, what the trouble was. When he said, what's the trouble, he pointed over our way. We were standing in front of the inside door to the office. There's no trouble here, Hinkle told the pig lieutenant. Everything is under control. That seemed to make the pigs mad. They couldn't do a thing to us because the person whose place we were in had no objection to our having guns there. We weren't doing anything illegal. I remember Sister Betty saying that she didn't want any cameras and Huey said, if you don't want any cameras on you, that's all right. But of course, by this time, a TV cameraman had showed up. ABC Channel 7 and Chuck Banks, the news reporter. We came outside. As I was coming outside, they were bringing Sister Betty out. And I was kind of in front there. I grabbed the magazine from a stack of magazines in the hall to use to block the cameras. Huey grabbed the magazine too and we came outside. I was holding this magazine up in front of the cameras and then all of a sudden 
Kenny Freeman popped up somewhere. We had Sister Betty Shabazz surrounded, but then Douglas Allen popped up from somewhere. And somehow he's walking with her. Even before we came out, the cameramen tried smashing in. They tried breaking in, and that's when Warren Tucker pushed them down the stairs. Then they tried taking a picture of one of the Panthers who pushed them away with a gun. They had already been trying to provoke something to get an incident going. Then as we came out, I walked out first and I was holding a magazine in front of the camera, about a foot away from it. And Huey came on out with Sister Betty and Douglas Allen and Kenny Freeman from the Paper Panthers. While she was coming down the stairs around front, the TV dude snatched at the book I was holding and I snatched it back. Then Huey put his magazine in front of the camera and Chuck Banks grabbed hold of Huey's magazine and pushed the book down into Huey's stomach. He didn't get his blowing good enough, but he did strike Huey. When he struck Huey in the stomach like that, Huey wasn't phased a bit. He let the magazine go and fired on Chuck Banks' head and knocked him back against the wall and against the man who was holding the Channel 7 camera. Then I looked around and saw all these pigs. I saw one of them unstrap this little strap that holds down the firing hammer on his 38 pistol. I said, Huey, cool it, man. Let's split, man. I grabbed a Huey's jacket on his right arm. Don't hold my hand, brother, he said. So I let go of his arm right away because I know that's his shooting hand, his right hand. Then I said, come on, brother, let's split. But Huey said, all right, all you pigs, all you cops, that man assaulted me. Now why in the hell don't you arrest him? Arrest that man. Come on, brother, let's split. I said, then a couple more of those cops flipped the little straps off the hook of their pistol hammers. And another brother came down and said, come on, Huey. Let's back on up here and get out of here, man. One of the brothers had his back turned on the pigs, and I guess Huey saw the cops pulling the straps off the hammers all of a sudden. So Huey says, Turn around. Don't turn your back on these back-shooting motherfuckers. Just like that, we all turned around. I turned around. Little Joe turned around. Little Bobby turned around. And Huey goes, Spread! And Jack says, Shell off into the chamber of his gun. Betty Shabazz was moving and gone by then. Kenny Freeman and Douglas Allen had hustled her off across the street. A big beefy cop moved forward. He had unhooked the strap off the hammer of his pistol and started shouting at Huey. Don't point that gun at me! Stop pointing that gun at me! He kept making gestures as though he was going to go for his gun. Huey stopped in his tracks. He was just staring at the cop. Then he walked right up within a few feet of this fat pig and said, What's the matter? You got an itchy finger? The cop didn't say a thing. He just stood there. You want to draw your gun? Huey asked him. The other pigs were calling for this one cop to cool it, but he didn't seem to hear them. He was looking right at Huey, staring straight into Huey's eyes. Okay, you big fat racist pig, draw your gun, Huey said to him. The cop didn't move. Draw it, you cowardly dog. And with that, Huey jacked a round off into the chamber of his shotgun. I'm waiting, Huey said. And man, he just stood there waiting for this pig to make a move toward his gun. All of the other cops moved back out of the line of fire. The five of us were spread out behind Huey. Finally, the fat pig just gave up. He let out a great big sigh and just hung his head. Huey almost laughed in his face. And we started backing up slowly. Huey backed up. He went near the wall, and I went to the outer edge of the sidewalk near the car. The sidewalk is at least 8 or 10 feet wide. Little Joe and Little Bobby were in the center, and another brother got out on the outside of the car in line with us and took about 6 or 7 steps. At this point, Roy Ballard came running up the street yelling, Hey, don't shoot that gun. The cops are going to kill us. They're going to kill us. Please don't shoot that gun. Then the cops started talking about, Don't you go for your guns. Don't you go for your guns. So Huey said, Don't you go for your guns. I remember repeating behind Huey, I said, That's right. Don't you go for your guns. Don't you touch your guns. I had flipped the little strap that went over the hammer of my thirty-eight. So we were standing there backing up, stepping off from the pigs, and the pigs were all bunched up. It was a very tense scene. 
This was one of the first major confrontations, and we were almost into a righteous shootout. You can think about a lot of shootouts. You can think about situations you might be in where there's going to be gunfire and gunfighting with pigs you know are racist. But I know how Huey felt. If just one of them had gone for his gun, he would blast him because Huey had his gun at a 45 degree angle to the ground and he was ready. He had the barrel of the gun in his left hand. His finger was on the trigger. He had knocked the safety off and had jacked the round off into the chamber. It kind of shook the cops when Huey jacked that round off in that chamber. We were just backing up then. I wasn't scared or anything like that. You don't even think about it in a situation like that because the situation is so tense. We were stepping off and the cops took three or four steps forward. Then they stopped and realized that we had them. The cops stopped. I said, come on brothers, let's move across the street. We got about halfway up the street, about 50 feet away from them, when they started bottling around to our right. We backed across the street and stopped the traffic coming off and on to the ramp to the Bay Bridge. Traffic was jammed up. I know people in the cars were sitting there wondering what in the hell was going on. Who in the hell are these niggas with these guns and the cops all on the street? My God. I could just imagine one of them sitting there in the traffic that couldn't move. We went across the street and got into our cars. Betty Shabazz was gone. So we split and went back down to the Paper Panther office. We got back there and Huey and the brothers were good. They were all talking about how we had spit on the pigs and how the pigs were all bunched up. Huey was talking about how so many of them were bunched up and how he had a shotgun on their butts and if one of them had gone for his gun. We told how we split and how we stood those pigs off. Some 30 odd pigs all bunched up on the sidewalk. How they had taken two or three steps and how Huey told them you better not go for your gun either. I know Leo and the rest of the dudes standing around there weren't too enthusiastic about the whole thing at all. And I thought that they should have been. I thought they should have been excited about how we covered Betty Shabazz. How the pigs went crazy and stuff like that. We went to the conference in Hunter's Point that night and decided not to speak. We got fed up with the whole thing man. They were just trying to make guards out of us. For some artwork shit sitting around there. They were trying to give us orders. What kind of shit was that? You guys have to be over there this evening man at 6. There's a lot of art and stuff that people might steal. You guys get over there and uh, guard that stuff. Huey says. Look. We're the security for Betty Shabazz and we're with Betty Shabazz. So we cut out. Went down. And talked to the brothers on the block. Who were shooting dice. Huey and I wouldn't think about that damn shit artwork in there. That's what's wrong with them. They want to put guys up to protecting the cultural nationalistic artwork when they should be organizing the brothers on the block. Me and Huey went down there with some guns and talked with those brothers out there on Hunter's Point. Talked to them about joining the party. We told them we were going to be out there and how the brothers have got to get together. And start arming themselves. We broke up a whole dice game. About 20 dudes. Some dudes were high. And wanted to be murder mouthing. Yeah I'm going to get a gun. But some of those brothers were serious. They wanted to get on with it. There had been riots in Hunter's Point, And the pigs had done in a lot of the brothers. They had already shot up brothers out on the point. Brothers and sisters had been murdered and brutalized. There was bad housing, unemployment, rats and roaches and hunger. Hunter's Point was a typical black ghetto. We went inside the auditorium where the conference was being held and talked to a bunch of brothers in there who were concerned about why we had the guns. Huey ran down the revolutionary program about why we had to defend ourselves, how it was legal then under the laws of California to carry guns, and how the right to bear arms is guaranteed to all citizens under the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. He also ran it down how the Black Panther Party 
was fixing to serve the black community with positive programs like Breakfast for Children, free health clinics, and liberation schools. That's what they should have been talking about inside that conference, called to commemorate the death of Malcolm X. But the thing had been put together by these cultural nationalists who were trying to project themselves as the leaders of the black community while trying to use the Black Panther Party. Actually, they should have called the conference to celebrate Malcolm X's birthday, rather than to commemorate the day he was assassinated. Those cats didn't know the gun laws. They didn't know that trying to lead people was a dangerous thing. They only came out to the airport with us because Huey had demanded it of them. After that little set in front of ramparts, we found out that their guns were not loaded. Not loaded? Huey said, you've never seen cats mad like us. The brothers in the party wanted to go over and beat their asses for having unloaded guns. They said, here our lives are on the line for our people and the bastards are trying to manipulate us. If a pig had started shooting, it would have run. I said to Huey, I'm out with all these jive intellectual cultural nationalists. That became a real thing in distinguishing the brothers off the block and those who only talk, those who have their intellectual possessions and pawn to the men, the power structure of this racist capitalist system. That's when David Hilliard said, they're paper panthers, jive punk paper panthers. Eldridge joins the Panthers. Early in 1967, Huey heard Eldridge on the radio. Damn, who is this cat? Huey kept saying, this cat is blowing, man. He's been in prison. Huey related to Eldridge as a Malcolm X coming out of prison. Huey always respected the brothers that came out of prison. He felt that he could relate to dudes who came out of prison. That was his whole key. Huey heard that this cat's been in prison, man, for nine years. That wrapped him up. We ran down to the radio station that night because Huey said, I'm going to talk to this cat. He said to Eldridge, Man, look, you got to be in the party. It doesn't make any difference what the name is. This is where it's at. We need you. We want you. He knew Eldridge could rap, and he's heard that he could write, that he was writing for Ramparts. Huey couldn't write, but you could get Huey cornered, get all his ideas out of his head, and put them on paper. He'll write if you corner him. But the shit travels fast. Huey understood the need for a media. Huey understands skills being functional for black people. That's what Huey wants. He pushed for a Panther newspaper. That's why we got a hold of Eldridge when we heard him on the radio that night. Eldridge told us, Look, I just got out of prison and I'm checking around. I'm trying to see what's happening. I said to Huey, This nigga from prison... This nigga is tired of shit. This nigga is like a Malcolm X to us at Voom. This nigga can write. One day, a few months later, Huey and I were in Eldridge's apartment. Eldridge had a leather jacket and a beret on. He said, fuck it. I'm in the Panther Party. That's all there is to it. I didn't know him then. I was looking at him and I was saying, well, fuck it. This is just another nigga saying he's in the party. But boom. We get to pounding out that first little leaflet, and that began to mean something. Next thing I know, we're over at Beverly Axelrod's house, and we're pounding out a paper, man. Footnote, Beverly Axelrod was the lawyer who helped get Eldridge out of prison. End of footnote. So I said, this nigga here is where it's at. Huey related to Eldridge more than I did initially. I just had a tendency to follow Huey. I was never ashamed of the fact that I always followed Huey. I just followed him, and I listened to him, and I tried to understand what he was saying. If I disagreed with him, I tried to disagree properly. Eldridge later told us that when he came out of the penitentiary, he was wired up behind Malcolm X. Malcolm was teaching that it was necessary to pick up the gun. Eldridge had been running around repeating what Malcolm had said. But he didn't know that there were some niggas that had already picked up the gun. 
He didn't know it until February when we started planning for Sister Betty Shabazz's visit. Marvin Jackman and all of those dudes were hiding it. They wouldn't tell Eldridge about us. Eldridge said that when he saw all us brothers with guns, all ready and organized, it didn't take him any time at all to relate to that. The only thing he didn't want to give up was the name that Malcolm X had for his organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, OAAU. But then he said the name thing was complicated because Malcolm's sister had taken it and incorporated it. There was so much confusion and so many phony people had gotten involved in the OAAU that when he tried to organize the Black House, he was sick of it already. So he just started moving with the party, going everywhere, making all the scenes. He was relating to it and functioning, but he still had some reservations. Eldridge just couldn't understand how it could happen, how we pulled this shit off, or why niggas would be crazy enough to go out there in the streets. It looked unbelievable. Eldridge said it scared him. That's what it did. Scared Eldridge. He said that when Malcolm was teaching, he was just dealing with rhetoric about how we had to organize a gun club. We had to do this. We had to have these guns, etc. He said it was abstract and he couldn't visualize it. Or if he did visualize it, he visualized a whole army, the black race armed. But then, when he saw us out there in the process of organizing, he saw about 10, 12 dudes with some guns, and he saw all those pigs. It looked like we didn't have a chance. It looked hopeless. But then many times it looked so beautiful and inspiring that he just had to relate to it. What turned all that around for Eldridge was that first scene when the brothers escorted Sister Betty Shabazz from the airport and came by ramparts. That had a huge impact, a huge influence on him. He said he didn't believe it even after he witnessed it. He said it was like observing pure instinct. What was so important to him was that when those pigs came by there, there were sisters and brothers on the street, and the minister of defense stepped forward. The shield between his people and the pigs jacked off that round into his shotgun and put his life on the line. That was it, Eldridge said. That was me there. The Death of Denzel Dowell the Black Panther Party was called to Richmond by the Dowell family. They had heard of the Black Panther Party over in Oakland. Mark Comfort came down to the office at 56 and Grove and told us that the Dowell family would like us to come over because Denzel Dowell had been killed in Richmond by a Contra Costa County deputy sheriff. We went out there that day and saw the Dowell family. They began to explain all the details about how certain people had said they heard 10 shots and the papers and the local media there were saying that only two or three shots were fired and how the coroner's office had originally told them he was shot nine or ten times but the police department said he was only shot once or twice how the pigs had lied about Denzel Dowell the brother telling about how he was trying to burglarize some place his brothers Carl Dowell and George Dowell explained how the pigs knew Denzel by name because they had arrested him a number of times. The pigs had made threats that they were going to get Denzel. It was just a cold-blooded killing of a black man. Some pigs were trigger-happy and wanted to shoot somebody. Shoot a nigger. They explained all this to us. Then the family took us over to the site where they killed Brother Denzel and showed us just where the bullets hit certain walls and the direction they came from. And the pigs lied and said that he ran and jumped the fence. The blood was 20 yards away from the fence. They must have dragged his body over to the other side and then over another fence. The blood was in two different places. We were investigating and a lot of black people in the black community there came out. They had noticed us panthers with our guns and everything. I guess there were 10 or 12 of us who went over there together and went through the whole process of investigation, of looking over what had happened and listening to the information that people were giving that contradicted all the crap that the pigs and the newspapers had run down and the people were looking. We were standing on the corner there in North Richmond 
There were about 150 people around, some in cars, some standing across the street. Some of the younger brothers, 15, 16, some 20 years old, were asking us about the guns, and we were explaining to them about the Black Panther Party. All of a sudden, some sister hollers out, Uh-oh, here come the cops! When the sister hollered, Huey jacked a round off into the chamber of his 18-inch shotgun with a loud click and clack. When he did that, I unhitched the strap that held the hammer down on my 45, and it clacked too. People started moving back. Some of them went across the street. Some got in their cars and drove up the street. Then the pigs came down and Huey stepped to the curb. I followed Huey and stepped to the curb, a few feet down from him. The pigs were surprised all of a sudden. They looked and noticed who was ready and standing tall for them. The pigs kept driving. Drove right on off, in fact. They speeded on and up and drove on away. Then the people moved on back, and some of them jumped around across the street, figuring there was going to be a shootout, but we just stood tall, ready to defend ourselves. We were educating the people that we would die here for them. This was the position we always took with Brother Huey P. Newton. We told the people there that we were going to have a rally that coming Saturday on the corner of 3rd and Chelsea, right down the street. We said we'd run down and educate them about the fact that we have to start using guns to defend ourselves because the racist pig cops were coming to our community and murdering our brothers and sisters. Brother Denzel Dowell was killed, and we found information about two, three other brothers who'd been shot up back in December in North Richmond there. The brothers had been shot in the armpits, which clearly showed they had their arms over their heads. Two brothers were killed in December and around April 1st. Denzel Dowell was gunned down by those pigs. Huey told them we were going to have a rally concerning this to tell the people it was necessary for us to arm ourselves for self-defense. We went forth to have this rally and we got about 20 brothers together with their pieces and their uniforms. We had the rally right there on the corner of 3rd and Chelsea. We got guns and a force to defend ourselves. Ain't no pigs going to come down here and stop our street rally. We're going to exercise our constitutional rights to free speech and we're going to have a rally right here on the corner. Most of North Richmond doesn't have sidewalks at all. But for that section on the corner there in front of this liquor store, there's an 8 to 10 foot sidewalk between the curb and the store. We got right out there on the corner and all the brothers out there in this community saw us with the guns. We lined up all along the streets. Imagine an intersection now. On one corner we put four, five brothers, and they were spread out about 20, 30 feet from each other, coming around the corner. Across the street, we put a brother on the corner, then two brothers down from him, 30 or 40 feet apart. Then on the corner where Huey and I were speaking, right there in front of the liquor store, we lined that corner up going east and west. Then we lined the other corner up as you go north and south. So the whole intersection was lined up with panthers, all up and down the corners, going north, east, west, and south on both sides of the streets. And we had our guns, shotguns, pistols, everything. The people began to line up, and Brother Huey told me to go ahead and start blowing. So I started blowing to the brothers there, running down to them about the 10-point platform and program, what kind of organization we had now about the fact that Brother Denzel Dowell had been killed by some racist dog Gestapo pigs, and the fact that we must begin to unify and organize with guns and force, that the Black Panther Party had come to North Richmond, and the Black Panther Party is there to serve the people. It's going to be a black people's party. I guess about two or three hundred people gathered around. In fact, people in cars just stopped. And the whole section on the one side of the street was just a line of cars. And on the other side, coming right up to the intersection, there was another line of cars. 
some cars were still moving by going on the other side of the street, driving up the wrong side of the street. I was blowing there, and then all of a sudden, they start sending some sheriffs in. The people had noticed that we were there. We were there with our guns. We were back again. The pigs started driving down the streets. The sheriff's pigs. Huey whispered. He said, Run it down about the pigs, Bobby. About how we're going to hold this street rally and how we're going to exercise our right of free speech. No pigs going to stop it. And he said, Tell them about the reason why no pigs going to stop it. It's because we've got guns and force here to protect ourselves, to protect the people. So I ran it down to the brothers and pointed to the pigs, and the pigs got nervous. I noticed one of the pigs stopped across the street and sat there and started listening. Four of the brothers came across the street and surrounded the pig car, standing about nine, ten feet away from it. One brother had a three fifty seven Magnum. Warren Tucker had a thirty eight pistol hanging on him and Reginald Forte had a 9mm pistol. One brother didn't even have a gun, and he got up there too. Then the pig got nervous. He started trying to light a cigarette, but the cigarette just fell out of his hand with all these people looking at him. The black people had guns and force ready to deal with the pigs, and the pig couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't light his cigarette. He was so nervous. He just up and drove away. The people yelled and raved at the fact. Huey P. Newton had placed the notion in their minds that we organized. I think the people respected the fact that Huey had all of the brothers organized because he had them all stationed up and down the streets, covering the intersection, guarding the lives of the black people, while we went forth to organize the people. They respected this organization that Huey put down. Huey put down a form, a discipline, that the gun was for our protection, and not for bull jive, so the pig had to split. Another pig was sitting there. This other pig came up in a car, and some of the people's cars moved along. But one man said, Well, I ain't moving my car. I'm going to sit here and listen. And this cop got caught in between the cars, and he couldn't move. And he had to sit there and listen to everything. He couldn't do nothing. And that brother didn't move his car. He had a Cadillac, too. And he and his woman were sitting in the Cadillac, sitting right ahead of the intersection. So this pig's car was right in between, and he couldn't move. And he just had to sit there and listen, and look at 300. That's right, he had to look at 300 mad niggas, mad at the pigs for killing Denzel Dowell. And 20 panthers out there armed with guns, disciplined, standing 30 or 40 feet apart on every corner of the intersection. So it was tied down. The people dug it, and they said, Right on! And Huey went on and blew to the brothers and sisters and told them how we're going to get organized and how we're going to start using guns and force in an organized and disciplined manner. In a very revolutionary manner, we're going to go forth, and we're going to defend ourselves against any racist attacks. And we're going to patrol these pigs. We're going to patrol our own communities. Even the old people are going to have to patrol from their homes and houses and everybody has to have a shotgun in his home everybody then George Dowell blew about his brother Denzel had been murdered by the pigs we said we're going to have another meeting over on 2nd Street and Huey said we're going to block the whole street off and ain't no pigs going to be allowed up the street at all at the second Richmond rally three or four hundred people came up they drove their cars all inside the street, and brothers got on top of cars and top of roofs all up and down the street from one corner to the next, and it was a pretty long block. The whole street was cluttered with cars. We were at one particular address where I think some relative of George Dowell lived. This was right around the corner from George Dowell's mother's home. All the people came around, and we had applications there for people to join the party. I guess just about everybody out there joined the party that day from little young 14 year olds and 12 year olds. We blocked the whole street off. Brother Huey Blue, I Blue, Brother Eldridge Cleaver came over and he blew to the people and the people dug it and the people filled out. 
the applications. One incident happened there. I noticed that one of the brothers moved some four, five guns to one of the corners. We were in the center of the block. Some more of the extra brothers had been moved down to one of the corners, the corner on the north end. The brother explained to me, I was blowing at the time, that one of the pigs had come up at the corner down there, so the brothers blocked the street off. One of the pigs was sitting there, so a couple of other brothers went over to the vacant lot and stood with their M1s and 30 odd sixes, looking at the pig's car. They couldn't have been 30 yards from the pigs. Stood staring right at the pig's car, and the pigs looked around, and one of them saw another brother walk up near his car and stand there, almost like a parade rest, but with his hand just a few inches from his 357 Magnum. And the pig looked at him when he got there, then he looked at his partner and said, That's a 357 Magnum he's got. And when he said that, the pig turned his engine on, and he got out of there and didn't come back. Then a helicopter came around. We blocked off the whole street and held a people's rally with power, gun power. Gun power's the only thing that's backed it up. So all they could do was send a helicopter over, flat, flat, flapping all day long to try and bother us. This time, it wasn't only the Black Panthers who came, but other people also came there with their rifles, with their guns, and with their pieces. I noticed some older brothers come out, and they were shaking hands with a lot of us, and they had their pieces under their shirts. They just carried them concealed, and some sisters, one sister came out and jumped out of a car with an M1. We saw the black community people getting up tight and ready, and the helicopter kept flapping over, and Huey pointed up at the helicopter as it was going over and said, Always remember that the spirit of the people is greater than the man's technology. And the people said, right on. I remember we got way over 300 applications. The community people got together and George Dowell's sisters and brothers and friends got together and began to have a regular session. And everyone would come to the meeting with the people of North Richmond. The brothers had their guns on. They were tired sick and tired and they loved brother Huey they thought brother Huey was out of sight he was a beautiful leader and Huey began to instruct them on many things on many ways they can go about dealing with the real problems one of the sisters brought up the problem at one of the nightly sessions that one of these school teachers beat up and slapped down a couple of black kids in school she wanted the Panthers the Black Panther Party to go to the school and she was going to get a lot of mothers and parents to go to the junior high school where her kids went. We all got together and scheduled it for that Monday. On Monday, we took three carloads of Panthers down to the school. All of them were armed to the gills. We got out of the cars with our guns and stood on the sidewalk. Right at the sidewalk, there's a fence to the schoolyard. All the little black kids ran over to the fence and all of the little white kids ran away from the fence and went and hid somewhere inside the school. Then the mothers came driving up. They went inside the school building to patrol the halls of the school. They patrolled the halls during lunch period and went and told the principal that they didn't want any more brutality upon their kids in the schools. We're concerned citizens and we'll whip your ass and anyone else's that we hear of slapping our children around. After about 20 minutes, while the mothers were patrolling the halls, the pigs drove up. This little young rookie jive pig, trying to look mean and thinking he was bad or something, walked up to the car. The brothers were sitting there in the car looking back at him because Huey had trained his brothers. Don't be moving in a rash manner. And they got shotguns, four motherfuckers, and ones. He looks in the car and sees all these pieces, and he moves back in a hurry. He got all nervous. Well, what the gun for? What the gun for? And I think Huey said, we're the Black Panther Party. Why? 
uh, uh, do you have any license? Do you have any driver's license? And Huey gave him his license. Well, you're Huey P. Newton, Minister of Defense Huey P. Newton of the Black Panther Party. And the pig was just shaking. He didn't know what to do, so he gave Huey his license back and went and got on his radio and called up another pig. They kind of hung off, away from us, looking and not knowing what to do. Shook, because there's too many niggers and too many guns down there for them. They called up another car and the principal of the school came out and tried to talk to the pigs. Their cars were parked a little way out in front of the sidewalk that leads into the door of the school, about 30, 40 yards or so behind ours. All they could do was sit there and wonder. And that's all they did was sit there and wonder. We went there with the mothers and they patrolled the halls for the lunch period and then we left. About four or five days later, we got a call at the Panther office. There was a session going on up in the 6th Street office in Richmond concerning the fact that the DA of the county had better do something, had better charge these cops who killed Denzel Dow. Me and Brother Huey and a number of other brothers all got together and walked off into the meeting there with our guns. The DA was sitting there and he looked up and saw Huey. He saw Huey with that big shotgun. The pig could see that Huey's shotgun carried a whole lot of rounds. And Huey had a bandolier holding 26 shotgun shells across his chest. Huey had a double O buckshot and the pig was definitely checking Huey out. Huey was decked out in the panther uniform, and he simply walked in and sat down. And he and the brothers and the sisters who were there talked about this pig, this D.A., talked about him like he was nothing, running it down about how rotten he is, and he is trying to give off some verbal sincerity. The people saw Huey, and they felt it was no time for them to be taking shit, because here's a man that we respect, here's a leader. He's armed down to the gills and he's articulate and he knows what he's talking about. They were ready to jump over there and snatch this DA's throat out concerning this whole situation and how Denzel Dowell was killed. We blew the dude away and told him he wasn't doing anything, wasn't serving the people, that he was jiving, that he was a swine and that he wasn't intending to do anything for the people, etc. But he came up and started talking about why don't you go to the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department up in Martinez? And if you go to the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department in Martinez, maybe you can get some results there. So the people said, we're going to go to the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department in Martinez. The mother and the father and the Dowell family wanted us to go to Martinez. And since we're a people's party, we generally go along with what the people want to do to serve them, especially if we think it will help them to raise their interest in unity and get support and try to begin to attempt to change the system. So we said, yes, we'll go to Martinez with the brothers and sisters here. We're concerned about this here. The Panthers will definitely be there. Somebody called the sheriff's department from the meeting and told them we were coming up and that the people wanted to come up and speak to them. The district attorney had to back it up. I think the people put so much pressure on him that he made the appointment for them within the next two or three days. They made him make the appointment right there at the meeting. They wouldn't let him get out of there till he made the appointment. That's what it was. He saw all these guns and the people's power, and he saw that the people were ready for Huey to use his gun on them. And knowing Huey, he'll defend the people. We loaded up in our cars, the community people of North Richmond and Black Panther officers and members, and we headed for Martinez, a couple of carloads of brothers and three or four carloads of community people went to the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department. When we got there, they had sheriffs standing all down the doorways and sheriffs all around. The brothers drove up, and the first six brothers got out. I think there were three shotguns, 
two or three M ones and one brother with a pistol. I drove around the block, but Huey got out. The sheriff's car came up directly across the street, right at the corner. The pig jumped out of the car, took his key out, and unlocked that little thing that holds the shotgun in it. He got his shotgun out and jacked a round off into the chamber of the shotgun. When he did that, Huey just stopped and looked at him, and the brothers were kind of in line right behind him, doing the same thing that Huey was doing, looking at the pig. Soon as the pig jacked that round off, Huey jacked the round off, and the brother next to Huey jacked the round off, and another brother jacked the round off, and another. And the only sound the pig heard was, clack up, clack up, clack up, clack up, right down the line. The sheriff looked at these panthers jacking these rounds off, took his shotgun, ejected his round out of the chamber, locked his shotgun back up, got back in his car, and drove away. That was the baddest set on the scene. I don't know who he thought he was. Those other sheriffs standing at the door were amazed and surprised because Huey turned right around and turned on them and walked up to the door and they said, you can't go in with no gun. And Huey said, What do you mean you can't go in with a gun? This is public property. This is people's property. We have a constitutional right to carry guns. And anywhere on public property, anybody can carry a gun. So we're going to go in with some guns. If you go in, we're going to arrest you. So Huey said, Okay, I'll tell you what we do. We take one brother who's going to volunteer to go in and take the arrest because we're going to make a test case out of this. Huey knew the law very well. Knew they couldn't charge anyone with coming on public property with guns because public property is paid for by the people's taxes. And since we have the right to have guns, a constitutional right, they can't charge anybody. Brother Reginald Forte said, Here I am, brother. He jumped forward. As he jumped forward to go in with the gun, the pigs all blocked up, about six of them. We were about 12 or 13 feet from the door inside the building. Reginald was getting ready to go into the elevator, and the pig said, No, you can't go in. No guns upstairs. Reginald Forte started saying, All right, now look. Let me go in. I'm going. I'm ready to go in. As Reginald Forte attempted to go in the elevator, six pigs stood shoulder to shoulder, holding themselves against him. Reginald Forte has his shotgun with him. He walked right up to them and bumped right up into them. The pigs wouldn't move. Reginald Forte said, Let me go in. He walked away and said, What's the matter? Then he walked right back right up to them again and bumped into them and said will you get out of the way so i can go through the elevator what are you doing blocking the passageway where people go through and he bumped into them again and the pigs are just standing there then reginald forte moved to go up the stairs about five feet to the side he moved to go up the stairs and some more pigs were bunched up together there he bumped up into them and said, Hey, what's the matter? Get out of the way so I can go in. They just held tight and wouldn't let anybody go by. Another pig came up and I think he said he was a detective of the Martinez City Police. And if you need somebody to protect your rights, etc. He was talking to Huey. Well, if you need somebody to protect your rights, he says, well, the police department, the sheriff's department will protect your rights. Huey P. Newton said, We don't need racist dogs who murder and brutalize us to try and protect us. Because we know you're brutal murderers. Get away from me. I can protect my own rights because I have my own gun. At this point, Huey got to arguing with him. And one of the pigs stepped on Huey's feet. Huey pushed him off and said, Get off my feet. Who do you think you are? Then this little jive who told us I can protect your rights all of a sudden said, 
Well, I think that all these people are disturbing the peace. That's what they're doing. And we're just going to have to place somebody under arrest. Huey got to telling about, you're disturbing the peace. And Reggie was over there bumping into these pigs, driving his body into them saying, move so I can go up, with a shotgun in his hand. Obviously, they weren't going to let anybody go up. So I called Huey back. I said, all right, Huey, come on. I said, let's go back in the car. Let's put the guns up and go up here for these people because the people do want us upstairs. And the sister there is explaining that she wants us to go upstairs. I think she wanted us to ball the head sheriff out. So we went back, locked all our guns in the car, and went to the brothers and sisters upstairs. We left one brother outside to guard the guns. We got upstairs and me and brother Huey and brother Eldridge all sat there, listening to this fool, one of those hog of hogs, with his fat belly hanging over his belt, talking about how he cannot do anything for us, that he does not want to make laws, and the best thing that we could do was go to Sacramento, to the legislature, where the laws are made. He kept trying to pass off some verbal sincerity and trying to double talk somebody. Brother Eldridge Cleaver got up and explained. He said, look, brothers and sisters, this dog, this swine here, ain't going to do nothing for us. This swine is double talking and jiving. We know he don't care about us, so why don't we all just walk out on this set? Everybody was disgusted and pissed off. After this pig talked about going to the legislature and all this kind of double talking crap, so we got up and walked out of the building and went back home. We went back and laid out the first Black Panther Black Community News Service paper. It was two sheets of legal-sized mimeographed paper printed on both sides. The headline was, Why Was Denzel Dowell Killed? We printed about five or six hundred of those papers and took all the Panthers and went out to the black community in North Richmond. We got to passing the papers out and giving them to the people. And children were following about 100, 150 kids on bicycles and some of them walking down the streets, following the Panthers, walking all throughout the community, block to block, passing out leaflets. We gave a lot to the kids and told them to put them on all the doorsteps. One young brother drove up on his bicycle, and I guess he hadn't seen the headlines on the paper because he said to us, How much will you pay me if I go and distribute all of them to the doors? Is them other little kids getting paid? And Huey said, No, none of the other kids are getting paid, young brother. He said, You see who's on the front page of this paper? And he looked and he saw Denzel Dowell's picture. He had a paper route and he was getting ready to do his route. The little boy looked at Huey and looked at Huey's gun and looked at Denzel Dowell and he said, Brother, he was very hurt. He said, Don't pay me nothing. I ain't even going to do my route. I'm going to distribute these to every door. And he just snatched up a bundle of them. And you could see him going down the street, trying to give everybody one, because the brother was remembered. The examiner came down to the Panther headquarters and did an interview on a Tuesday. They said they were going to print it on a Sunday. That Saturday evening, the headlines hit about the existence of the Black Panther Party, who patrolled cops in the black community. They wrote it all backwards. They said we were anti-white and were black racist. After that, Huey began talking about how we needed to go straight up in front of some city hall as we did in Martinez and talk to the people and hold a rally there so we could get a message over to the mass of the people. And the mass media would come along and cover it. We saw another article in the paper about the Black Panther Party about three or four weeks later. We all read the papers and realized that the news of the existence of the Black Panther Party was being widely distributed especially in the Bay Area. One Monday morning, Huey called me up and said, Bobby, come over to the house right quick. I went over to the house. Huey showed me the papers. He said, look, 
Mulford is up in the legislature now, trying to get a bill passed against us. We don't care about laws anyway, because the laws they make don't serve us at all. He's probably making a law to serve the power structure. He's trying to get some kind of law passed against us. I've been thinking. Remember when I told you we have to go in front of a city hall, in front of a jail, or do something like we did in Martinez to get more publicity so we can get a message over to the people? This was Huey's chief concern, getting the message over to the people. So Huey says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to the Capitol. I said, the Capitol? He says, yeah, we're going to the Capitol. I said, for what? Mulford's there, and they're trying to pass a law against our guns, and we're going to the Capitol steps. We're going to take the best Panthers we got, and we're going to the Capitol steps with our guns and forces loaded down to the gills. And we're going to read a message to the world, because all the press is going to be up there. The press is always up there. They'll listen to the message, and they'll probably blast it all across this country. I know. I know they'll blast it all the way across California. We've got to get a message over to the people. Huey understood a revolutionary culture, and Huey understood how arms and guns became a part of the culture of a people in the revolutionary struggle. And he knew that the best way to do it was to go forth and those hungry newspaper reporters who are shocked, who are going to be shook up, are going to be blasting that news faster than they could be stopped. I said, all right, brother, right on, I'm with you. We're going to the Capitol. So we called a meeting that night before going up to the Capitol to write the first executive mandate for the Black Panther Party. Huey was going to write executive mandate number one. This executive mandate was the first major message to all the American people and all the black people, in particular in this country who are living in the confines of this decadent system. Eldridge and Huey and all of us sat down, and it didn't take us long. We weren't driving. No time at all, not like some of the intellectuals and punks that have to take 10 days before they can write an executive mandate to put things together. I don't think it was 15 minutes before we whipped that executive mandate out, looked it over, and Eldridge corrected it and got things together. The executive mandate was the first message, the first major message made by the Black Panther Party coming from the Minister of Defense, Huey P. Newton. Huey told me to organize the brothers, tell them to get their guns and be at the office tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. We're going to leave at 10 o'clock. We're going to leave at 10 o'clock sharp.